Hello, beautiful lights, and welcome to another episode of From a Medium's Perspective. Well, we have four segments to our show. In the first, we're going to be taking a look at ghosts, poltergeists, and apparitions. What's the difference from a medium's perspective? And then we're going to take a deeper look at the dove as a totem. Later on the show, I'm going to be sharing a real-life story that's extracted from one of my readings in our Tales from the Other Side. This week, we're going to have a tale about the crossing over experience of an atheist. We'll close our show with a psychic exercise for people to try at home, and this one's going to focus on our psychic self-defense skills. I'm going to share first, as I mentioned, about ghost poltergeists and apparitions. We never quite expect those in the unseen realm to appear out of thin air. But numerous encounters with ghosts experienced by normal, everyday people trigger the questions that I hear on a regular basis. What are they? Why are they there? Have they crossed over? What do they want? Why won't they leave me alone? How can I tune them out? And on occasion, I get asked, what's the difference between a ghost, a poltergeist, and an apparition exactly? Well, ghosts are the spirits of those that have passed. They are the conscience, sentience, and individual essence of being of a soul, and they have etheric bodies. They are specifically those people that have a strong tie to the physical realm. You don't have to be a medium to see them. The reasons that they haunt us is pretty unique and personal to each one. And they may or may not be aware of us, which we don't often think about. We think about not too many people being able to see spirits, but not all spirits can see us either. They might be caught in a loop, repeating a cycle of actions in an effort to understand what happened just prior to their passing. They might have regrets that need to be released or told or secrets that need to be conveyed to those left behind. Some are territorial, trying to possess a physical space, even after transition, and might be in denial of their current state of being. Some are loyally waiting for the arrival of a lost loved one, unaware of the passage of time, or the knowledge that if they were to go ahead and cross over and let go of this material plane, they would be able to find that person. Some are afraid that they're going to encounter punishment or not have a place to be if they cross over. Others might have transitioned so quickly they simply don't realize that they've passed. Poltergeists, on the other hand, are lower vibrational spirits that have either a retained anger or have become upset since passing. Sometimes they become frustrated because of the lack of attention that they've received from those of us in the living. They may or may not realize that they have passed, and therefore they don't comprehend that most of us can't hear or see them. So in an effort to be acknowledged or sometimes out of a predatory intent, they up the intensity of their efforts to be recognized. Lower vibrational energies can be pretty much insatiable in their desire for attention. They often use fear as a tactic to gain recognition. Their drive is always to be the center of attention, to be seen, pitied, feared, or catered to. We as humans are technically made of energy, and therefore we can have an electrical or kinetic effect on objects, both in body or out. We can influence physical things in either state, and this is because of our physical state being an extension of the etheric one. Energy cannot be destroyed, only changed. And as such, even when we are not expressed in a physical body, we in spirit can affect the physical. Spirits can cause the interruption of lights, make knocking sounds, project their voice or the sound of music move objects like we saw in the movie Ghost with the penny on the wall and transfigure their likeness within the shadows 
over objects. Pretty much anything to let us know that they exist. Not all ghosts are lower vibrational. Some might have been the victim of a violent crime or severe abuse. They might have chosen to stay close, needing to comfort those who had lost them and maybe communicate the details of their passing or letting those left behind know that they're safe now. Apparitions, on the other hand, are generally spirits that bring a message. They can be spirits of our loved ones. They can be higher beings, angels, or maybe even ascended masters like Mother Mary, Lord Lanto, Kuan Yin, Serapis Bay, St. Germain, etc. They can guide us out of unfamiliar terrain or difficult situations. And there's a particular significance to their appearance. So ghosts are the wanderers of the spirit world. Poltergeists are the troublemakers. And apparitions bring us messages. So the next time that you see a ghost or encounter an apparition, see if you can figure out what it is they want to tell you or why they might be there. There is a reason for their visitation. But what if it's a poltergeist or a lower vibrational energy, as I called it? Well, there are several ways to cope. The first is to know that the material world and your will trumps anything in spirit. Odd, I know, to think about it, but that's the fact. In the last segment of today's show, I'll be talking a little bit about psychic self-protection And in short, for now, let me say that two incompatible vibrations cannot coexist. Before you start to question yourself thinking, well, if I have negative energy near me, then it must be because I'm negative, because like attracts like, and there must be something desperately wrong with me. Remember that, yes, like does attract like, but also opposites attract And sometimes a negative vibrational will be attracted to the light that we carry. They're drawn to it by what they're missing within themselves. All beings respond to love and peace. And at some level, they do feel it. But fear pushes love away and anger and other negative or lower vibrational emotions. And this is true not only for those that have crossed over, but for us here. It's really important to have compassion for those that have suffered, but perhaps even more compassion for ourselves in forgiving the ways that we have needed to do the things that we have done and the choices that we have made in an effort to cope with our own suffering. So be kind. Be kind to others. And be kind to yourself. And that's from a medium's perspective. A man had returned home. This was in the turn of the century in the early 1800s. And he had found his family, his wife and children, brutally massacred. His natural instinct was that he didn't want anyone else to see them in that condition. He was protective of them. In his grief and shock at what he found, He decided that he would burn the house down in order to prevent other people from seeing the horror that his eyes beheld upon returning from work. So he set fire to the house. Unfortunately, whether it was due to the weather or the change in temperature in the house, as the bodies began to burn, he woke from his sort of trance-like state that he was in and realized that He needed to get out of the house. And as he tried the door, the door refused to open and he was overcome by smoke inhalation. Because he passed in a state of unacceptance, not being able to digest what it was that had occurred for him and for his family, he kept coming back at the same time of day, every day, trying to have a different outcome We hear that expression, don't look for sanity in an insane place, or insanity is looking for a different answer from the same situation. 
But in his case, it was his grief that pushed him into that state. He perpetually would go back to try to find a different solution. I did work with him as a spirit, and he told me that his wife's favorite flowers were black-eyed Susans. So I picked some for her and put some crystals and things of beauty on an altar for them and talked to them mind to mind. I'm not sure if he's completely free yet of his loop, but I felt that he had acknowledged it because oddly enough, everyone that entered that particular building had trouble with the door. But after that, the door was much easier to manage. So who knows? I do do work with people to clear energies in their home and businesses, etc., to untangle that kind of mystery for people that are being bothered by a particular spirit. Each of us as a soul emits a particular vibration because we're electrical beings, we're energetic beings. I'm sure you've been in the presence of someone when you were with them, you just felt better, you know, you just felt calm. I had someone that used to work with me when I ran a restaurant and I would ask her, I'd say, odd gun, stand by me. And she would be like, why? And I'd say, because I feel better when you're there. And it would help me to get out of my fear of responsibility and production stress that I had there. So each of us has a particular resonance, but it's not just the individual differences between people that have passed but there are those differences and personal vibrations that we find at all levels, whether it's in the angelic realm, the guides and teachers realm, the ascended masters. We have totems and all kinds of different beings around us. And I'll be talking about some of those differences in future shows. But let's just suffice it to say that we each have our own signature and sort of the closer we are to the source of all that is in our thoughts and intents, however you view that, whether that be God for you or whether it be the Big Bang, or I think they just disproved that one, so I guess that one's out. But whatever you view the source of creation of everything that is, the closer that you are to that vibration of perfect love, perfect light, and perfect sound, the more likely it is that your vibration will have that effect as it flows through you towards other people. Of course, the lower vibrational energies are people that are preoccupied or spirits that are preoccupied with their own feelings, maybe detached a little bit from the needs of other people. I guess it's possible they can do harm, but we can also protect ourselves against that. And we'll be talking about that later. Today, I wanted to talk about the dove totem, the dove as a totem. Totem animals are animals that are associated with our particular energy. They might be related to a particular people or tribe, such as the bird people of Virginia, or maybe a group such as the mighty eagles of Prince Edward County High School in Farmville, Virginia, where I grew up. But beyond tribe or group, each of us has a specific set of animals that resonate to our energies. Some of them stay with us for a lifetime. One of my lifetime totems is a wolf. Other mediums and some of my students have noted that they saw a wolf or wolves in my energy field. So I guess it's not just in my head. (laughs) And each of us would have a specific one. Each person would have a main totem and then other totems. Animals will enter our lives to bring attention to various aspects of our life. For instance, if we started to notice squirrels, it might be to draw our attention to the need to put back a little capital for the lean times. The dove totem has become a universal symbol of peace, beauty, faith, and truth. It's a spiritual messenger. The dove is also a symbol of romance, friendship, hope, and magical protection. Doves mate for life. The dove blesses romantic relationships with loyalty, longevity, and deep bonds of intimacy. 
and are often used in wedding ceremonies to symbolize those aspirations for the couple. If you're lonely, the appearance of this spirit means that happiness is soon to come. The spirit of dove is one of harmony, balance, and purity of heart. It symbolizes victory in a challenge, test, or trial. The dove can also bring some warnings. Beware of trying to make everyone happy or being too placid or passive or trusting. Let serendipity be your guide and trust in the power of love. Totems often appear in our lives to signify change and they help us focus on a particular aspect of our spiritual development or to help bring us messages from beyond. In my life, the dove has a particularly special meaning. A few years ago, I was driving with my husband at the time and my children, and we had had a 24-hour trip back to our home. We were exhausted, and when we arrived there, there was a police car parked outside. I wasn't really sure why they would be there, but they had brought a message from my mom that my father had passed. So we went directly to my parents' home, uh, made it through the funeral, and finally returned to our home. But as we pulled into the parking lot this time, a mourning dove fell out of the air right in front of the car. I stopped the car, jumped out, and picked it up. It was alive, but its wing had been broken. So I took it inside, I rigged its wing with kind of a makeshift splint, always wanted to be a veterinarian, and I fed and cared for it until it was well. A few weeks later, I released it, and it flew happily away on its mended wings. Since then, when I see a dove or hear one cooing, I feel my dad's presence nearby. He's chosen the dove as a spirit animal to remind me that he's near, and the oddest things have occurred with doves since then. On a recent visit to my mom's home, I was walking toward my room, and it sounded like there was a dove in my room. It sounded like it was shouting, and I checked the window, and there it was, sitting on the sill. As soon as I acknowledged it, it flew away. For me, that was as if my dad had welcomed me home. And on the first day of this radio show, I went out to call my dogs in and a dove flew off the steps directly in front of me. And I felt like my dad was giving me a visual message. As a medium, I don't have to have doves or squirrels bring me messages because I can easily connect with my dad and others in spirit and have a conversation. But I found it special, magical even, that my dad would find that way to bring me such a personal message to keep my eyes forward, that it'll be smooth sailing, and I'm with you. So look and listen to the natural world around you for your messages from spirit, and meditate or ask your totem animals to show themselves to you. It's a wonderful world. If somebody isn't accustomed to accepting counsel from the other side, or talking to people on the other side, they do kind of wonder, what would I ask? Why do we get a reading? There are lots of answers to that. It isn't just one answer. Some people come to me because they are needing closure. And some continue on to to sort of use me as a grief counselor. I'm not a counselor, but they find it soothing and deep and effective and efficient for them to actually be able to communicate with the one that they've lost some of those people go on to learn how to do it themselves because I do teach psychic and mediumship development. Other people come to me sort of like a life coach. They have situations that they're working through. I've helped people through divorces and through custody proceedings, navigating relationships, job changes. I had one client recently that worked in very high security for the government and was a contractor, 
and they needed to be able to have their sights ahead for what was happening, and it helped them stay secure during a transition that otherwise might have taken them out of the market. I help people determine whatever question they have, really, about, I kind of think of myself as a truth specialist, I guess. (laughs) So the psychic part is feeling things through. So people might have questions about their past, things that are going on for them in their lives or their future. And then not everybody wants to talk to spirit. Some of my clients are very adamant. I do not want any dead people in here. So the psychic end is more intuitive and the mediumship is communication specifically with spirits. I also do animal communication. Sometimes I have people come for past lives. Looking into that, I don't use regression or anything like that. I just get there with them. And sometimes they want to know about their guides and angels. I'm also a spirit artist, so sometimes I'll draw for them. So it just depends on the person. I tailor it to each person. I tell people, you know, I've died a thousand deaths because I've felt what it was like, but not in the intensity, of course, that they did. Spirits are kind enough to share with me how they transitioned and how it felt for them. And that's a great way to head into our next segment, a tale from the other side. This week, we're going to be focusing on the experience of an atheist that crossed over. I think of the contacts that I experience with the people that cross as a really sacred thing. And it's because of the depth of emotion that they and my clients feel. To me, it's the highest honor to be trusted enough to be allowed into that most intimate world of grief. Grief is suffered on both sides of the veil. We don't often think about that, but when a person crosses over and leaves their physical body behind... That departure can evoke very strong emotions on both sides of the veil. For every soul, it is different, highly unique, and we're not always greeted by loved ones or an ascended master or our angels. Those loving energies are always there for us, but our particular experience is carefully crafted to fit perfectly to our state of mind at the time of our crossing. And so it does come up as a question, you know, well, what if somebody doesn't believe there is another side? Does that affect their experience? What's it like for them? One of the things that I'm most amazed by is the intensity and patience of the unconditional love that's available to us, both over there and here. We tend to overlook it here in this world, too. And whoever the soul is, they are treated with respect when they cross. They are allowed time to adjust themselves to their new setting, and a place is set aside for them to be upon arrival, depending on their state of mind and desire. They're either attended to or left to themselves until they're ready for additional help. During one reading with a client, I noticed that her father was there, and I asked her, is your father in spirit? She said yes, and he was standing way back from her. And I said, he wasn't a religious man, was he? And she goes, ha ha, no, he was an atheist. And I said, and he wouldn't have been particularly comfortable with this situation of um, mediumship, psychic reading here. And she said, oh, no, probably not. But she wanted to know, how was he? How was he doing? So he was kind enough to share his crossing over experience with me. When he came to an awareness, he found himself in sort of, a, for lack of a better word, a room. It was sort of shoebox shaped, but very large. And he was lying down. He had passed on his back. He was in the same position that he had passed in. As his awareness came to the front, it's almost like the lights had been dimmed. Do you know how when you're stressed out, it helps to have lights low? And so there wasn't anyone there. Uh, It was just empty, kind of dim in there. And he was lying there and he suddenly thought, oh my goodness, I'm dead, but I can think. And it was like an explosion in his mind, like an epiphany to beat all epiphanies for him. 
it shook him. It racked him for a long time. But there wasn't anyone there to taunt him or say, hello, welcome to the other side, sign up here. You know, it was just a very respectful way for him to be able to, at his own pace and time, come to an awareness that he was still existing beyond the body. After that thought kind of ran through him, he began to be aware that outside this room, and I say room with that tone because there weren't actually any walls. It was almost like a delineation of space. And outside that, it was brighter. And it felt to me like you would feel if you were in a house and it was sunny outside, but you're inside your house and you can sort of feel that it's brighter out there, but you're obviously not in the sunshine. He heard voices and another wave of shock ran through him. (laughs) He was like, whoa, there are others. No one messed with him. He had time just to let that sink in and just digest the concept that he wasn't the only one. Once he adapted to that, he decided, well, the thought began to go through his mind. I wonder what, and before he could finish the sentence of it's like out there, boom, he was standing at the top of a road. It was sort of a rural setting. Everything was kind of translucent in a way that had sort of a light from within, golden a little bit. You hear about streets of gold. There is color in the etheric realm, but this is his personal experience. And down on the left side was a hamlet. And I have to assume that the hamlet was significant to him in terms of his lineage or his understanding of places. So there was a little village down to the left. The road kind of went up a gentle slope and then dropped down enticingly in front of him around a bend that he couldn't quite see. And over to his right-hand side, there were three people talking. He heard them, and they didn't approach him or anything. And he wasn't aware that they were his guides because he didn't believe in guides. So no one was going to shock him by saying, hello, we're your guides. As he adjusts to standing in this beautiful, relaxed country setting there, a tall man with a longer beard, older and wiser looking gentleman comes up over the road toward him. And again, I recognize that that was one of his master teachers. And the man asked, would you like to look around? Her father said, yes, I would. The message that he gave his daughter was that I'm just wandering. I'm just wandering around. So that's a tale from the other side. Some people speculate, do we each have our own reality? I don't know how to answer that because it's a matrix and everything is connected and these are actual states of being and actual places. It certainly does make the mind wander and contemplate things that are so interesting. Well, I think we will get our psychic knuckles cracking. Today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about psychic self-protection. The first thing I want to say is that if you are just a regular person, which most of us are, (laughs) it's still a good thing to know how to manage the energies that are around you and that you're comprised of. But for those of you that are intent on learning more about how to work with spirit and that are building your connection with the other side, it's a pretty basic practice that you're going to need to implement. You wouldn't, for instance, go to Siberia and step outside snowy, icy, frozen winter morning without wearing appropriate clothing. And it's important that if you work in the spirit realm, that you protect yourself. It's not anything to be afraid of. It's just you're not afraid of your mucklucks and your big coat. So don't be afraid of psychic self-protection. It's no big deal. It's just something you do. In general terms, there are only two tools that a negative vibration or a lower vibrational can use. Those are fear 
and lust. Fear can come through anger or depression. Lust is an old term that we don't hear much anymore. And it's not talking about healthy passion. I'm an advocate of healthy passion on every single chakra level. It is something that's irrational that kind of takes our focus away from us. So they just have two tools. So that's kind of nice to know that they don't have a really big toolkit, just two tools, fear and lust. There are three types of psychic self-protection that I've identified. There may be more, but the three that I'm aware of, the first is our life contract protection. And that is the protection that we get just because we were ballsy enough to sign a life contract and come up in this jank. So if we are in the material realm, we have the automatic protection of our guardian angels. We don't have to ask for it. They're going to help us. And I think all of us know that we have that somehow, even if we don't really think about it consciously, because we say things as a society. We say things like, well, I guess it wasn't their time. What are they talking about? They're talking about our life contract. And that covers things that are just amazing. It covers things like accidents where people drown and they're brain dead, you know, without oxygen for four minutes and it's past the human possibility to survive, but they're okay. And so we say, well, I guess it wasn't their time. But if it is their time and they do pass, then we often say something like, well, I guess they've gone with the angels. At some level, innately, we understand that we do have protection in our life contract. The other kind of protection, the second kind of protection that we have is protection that comes by the things that we do. We think of a visualization. We picture a bubble around us. We use sage. We put crystals. We wear an amulet. So those are personal protection. And the third type of protection is invoking our guides and angels. And why would you have to ask your guides and angels anyway? Aren't we automatically protected? In reality, our guides and angels respect our etheric will, which is our higher will, which means they will never violate us. So we have to ask them to act on our behalf. And so I'm going to share an affirmation with you that I learned when I was going through a little bit of a psychic attack bump. I learned it directly from my guides and the help of another medium. And it's really simple and effective. And it goes like this. I see and I visualize protection around me. And I know that I am protected throughout this day or night or circumstance. So I see and I visualize protection around me, and I know that I am protected throughout this evening. Simple, not flashy, but effective. And then I wanted to leave you with an exercise that you, especially is good for empaths, if you're going into a dense emotional or spiritual environment or anywhere you feel like you need to separate your energies from those that are around you, either physically or non-physically. And it's called the rainbow zipper. It was taught to me again by another medium. What you do is you realize that you have chakras, seven chakras that run like a rainbow, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet as it comes up from our base chakra to the one over our head called the crown chakra. And so if you will either visually or personally put your hands over your head and realizing that your aura is something that's spread out, you're going to have to bring that behind a line. And so as you take your hands, imagine a zipper as you pull one hand down the front, pulling your energies behind that line. And that will enclose it. And that will help you to be aware, but not necessarily vulnerable to the energies of other people. And that's our psychic development exercise for today.